I'm Karen Riggs. I'm the County Engineer for Cochise County. And my name is Cyrus Miller. I'm a Project Manager a Hydrologist with J.E. Fuller Hydrology and Geomorphology. Looking behind us to the watershed that's bringing water down to this project. Those are the Huachuca Mountains in the background. Um, Ash Canyon is one of the canyons you can see. And behind us you can see that there's no channel here. This is just sheet flow area. So the water is just spreading and running all the way from the top of those mountains down here and into what we'll show you in just a few minutes, which is a, a basin that collects all this sheet flow, routes it underneath Palominas Road and into 13 recharge basins that infiltrate the water as it gets closer and closer to the San Pedro River. And what you can see behind us is the watershed uh, measures about seven and a half square miles. And if you can imagine the amount of water that runs off seven and a half square miles, it's quite a bit. And so we've designed our project to handle not only the flood and the flood control aspect of that, but also to slow down and meter the water out into the optimal areas for recharge of the aquifer. And we'll show you as we go through this tour that you're gonna take, um, every item that has gone into the design, why it was put there, and how we are instrumenting and monitoring this project so that we can learn every bit of information we can from it, and also to very clearly show how much recharge we're accomplishing with our project. Behind me you can see a big wall and the tops of some school buses. This is the Palominas Elementary School and this area has had flooding problems for about as long as anyone can remember. The wall that you see was actually built by the county to keep the flood water out of the school. So what, what, what you see behind me, uh, the rocks in the background, uh, is what we call the primary spillway. Uh, or a riprap chute. Uh, this, the purpose of it is to take the water, collect the water from the upland, uh, from the wash, schoolhouse wash as it flows towards the project, uh, and collect and convey down elevation uh, in, a, in a short period, in a short amount of time, short, short distance, uh, without um, causing erosion, and then uh, transition the flow back into sheet flow as it moves its way across the basin, across the detention basin, and towards the primary outlet structure. We're in the bottom of the main collection basin. This is the depth gauge to show us how deep the water gets. It's got to get to three feet before it runs over the top of the um, main, infil main inlet, which we'll show you in just a minute. Uh, after two monsoon seasons, we've never gotten higher than a little over a foot and a half in the basin. I'm standing here at what we call the primary outlet feature of the detention basin. It's a combination uh, weep hole and great inlet structure, much like you might see a uh, great inlet structure on a roadway or in a parking lot. The water level rises and if it gets high enough, this is a three foot uh, elevation, a three foot depth in the basin. Uh, if it gets high enough, goes over and spills over into the grate uh, and into the box, which is outlet by the three 36 inch CMP corrugated metal pipes that flow through the main berm of the detention basin. What we see here behind me is the secondary outlet, which is an overflow, emergency overflow, a weir that uh, outlets the flow if the, uh, if the elevation was to get too high to overwhelm the system of the detention basin. Um, the primary outlet is the is the culvert system that's behind me here. Uh, the three CMP corrugated metal pipes that uh, outlet flow to the channel and they all provide what we call the, the the outlet of the detention basin. I'm in front of the box culverts that go under Palominas Road. Uh, these were actually built before we designed the project. There were two very small box culverts here that uh, very frequently overflowed and caused flooding problems both on the road and then downstream as it spread. So uh, we, the flood control district um, got design and we ran the construction project to replace those small box culverts with four 10 by four box culverts. 
This will start our tour of the actual infiltration basins of the part of the project. We've captured all the storm water on the west side of the road. Now we're, we'll be walking down through 13 basins that are the heart of the infiltration and the recharge. Um, every basin is instrumented. We're gathering data from every one. Um, and Cy, I'll tell you a little bit about how we actually came to put the recharge on this side of the road. During design and during analysis, we determined that the uh, east side of Palominas Road and the constructed county flood control channel there was the optimal area for infiltration. Not only was it better soil, more conducive to infiltration, but it was also closer to the river that you can see behind us here. So we leveraged the existing county facility, the existing constructed county flood control channel, and augmented it with the infiltration basins using the weir walls, uh, concrete weir walls that uh, allow for the water to cascade uh, slower velocities um, uh, down the system and infiltrate into the subsurface. Uh, inside of those <coughs> infiltration basins, we've got different types of uh, infiltration uh, augmentation features, we might call them uh, dry wells, both single cell and dual cell and then also infiltration trenches, uh, trenches filled with coarse washed gravel uh, below the subsurface. And we, so every, every augmentation type is instrumented, but we have several basins that don't have additional infiltration methods. Those are also instrumented. Every basin down here is instrumented so that we can analyze exactly what recharge we're getting in which basin at what time. And so as we analyze the data that we collect, we can hopefully determine which features, which augmentation features, if any, are more appropriate um, from a cost perspective and from a benefit perspective uh, for infiltrating water into the ground and apply those for future projects. And you know, this was the first county recharge project. Uh, since that time, uh, several different properties have become available through partners. We've done initial engineering analysis on several of those. And so everything that we're learning here is going into our toolbox for future design of recharge projects in the basin. This is one of the monitoring wells that was put in as part of the project. We'll see uh, as we go down the channel toward the end a well that we started monitoring before the project was built that was already in. This was put in as part of the project to monitor depth to groundwater. So it's just like a regular well except that we're not pulling any water out. But it is instrumented so that we can tell things about it. This has a pressure transducer that's uh, down into uh, the well, down into the casing, that we can record water depths essentially, uh, measure the depth uh, or the elevation of the water table. This actually is the uh, point where we've noticed the most profound and the most distinctive um, rise in elevation of the water table uh, as a result of the project. Uh, this is kind of in the middle. We, we took a look at the detention, the detention basin portion and we're going to look at the channel downstream, but this is where we've noticed the greatest rise in water surface uh, of the aquifer um, since the project was put in. What we have here uh, is what we call an instrumented borehole. This is essentially a well that's been ad advanced down into the subsurface. Um, instead of taking water from the ground, we're um, measuring the soil moisture at different levels uh, within the subsurface. We're standing at one of the single chamber dry wells in basin six of the 13 basins that comprise our actual recharge portion of the project. Um, we are, this measures the flow that comes in and how effective these are compared to the other basins. This dry well uh, is much like you might see um, in a parking lot or in a retention basin. Uh, they're used in Arizona quite frequently. Uh, they're used a lot in the Phoenix metro area. Uh, what this is is essentially a well that's drilled, a, a boring that's uh, advanced to 10 feet above the water table. Um, the, the boring um, material that's removed is replaced with uh, coarse gravel and then um, uh, as the water comes in, uh, this accepts the, 
stormwater and infiltrates it into the subsurface faster than it might otherwise um, uh, infiltrate into the uh, native material that we have on site. What we have here is another pressure transducer. Uh, the PVC pipe um, uh, houses a pressure transducer that's down in the subsurface. Um, at the top is the uh, data collection point. Uh, this device, much like the other pressure transducers in the system, measures depth and records that depth over time. And from that, we can determine the effectiveness of the uh, infiltration trench, how fast it's infiltrating the water in into the subsurface. This is a infiltration trench. This is one of the tests that we did in some of the basins. In this basin, we actually have two. There's one at each end of the basin. You're looking at one at the downstream end. And what we're testing here is kind of a low tech uh, approach that we're testing against the dry well notion. So Sai, can you tell them about how we did it? Yeah, this is uh, a trench. Basically what you're seeing is the top, the top surface of the trench. Uh, beneath us, we've got a 12-inch uh, layer of this coarse rock that you see here, what we call riprap. And then beneath that, we've got five feet in depth of coarse washed gravel. <clears throat> and that coarse washed gravel is intended to uh, promote infiltration, accelerate the water as it gets down, in, uh, down into the subsurface. It uh, infiltrates a lot faster than the native dirt would, would uh, otherwise. <clears throat> And the, the riprap cap is intended to prevent erosion and the, the coarse wash gravel underneath is intended to promote uh, infiltration. Uh, we actually, uh, during construction, the contractor uh, notified us that they had uh, encountered some more um, suitable material for infiltration, some what we call, what we call coarse grained soils uh, during construction. And, and we, we moved some of the locations of these basins that I had laid out during construction, or during design rather, um, the, so we, we, we adapted to fit the site conditions that we encountered once, once we started digging. It was interesting. We, we did have a really good relationship with the contractor who was quite excited about the project and uh, as Sai said, they said, hey, we think we found a better place for your infiltration trench because you'll get better infiltration in the soil right here. So we took advantage of them being on site, you know, every minute of the project. And in, in the type of infiltration that we're doing and in the desert environment, the enemy of recharge is evaporation because we have so much evaporation naturally here. You want to get the water you want to capture below the ground surface as soon as possible because you know every hour that it's ponding above the surface, you're losing part of it to evaporation. So that's why the infiltration trenches, that's why the um, dry wells, in addition to just the basins, we're, we're gathering the data to find out how can we be the most efficient at putting that water underground quickly? We're at the dual chamber dry wells. We've looked at the single chamber dry wells already. Um, this is we part. This is a pilot project. So our one of our goals was to test a bunch of different recharge methodologies and see what really worked best here. Because what we're doing here is pretty different. We're looking at. Uh, recharging sheet flow storm water. Uh, we, you know, we've looked at where it settles in the big basin, but we're still looking at how we best take that slow moving water and recharge it. So these are the dual chamber dry wells. So you'll have a chamber under here. The water flows in, flows through. The difference between this and the single chamber dry well is that in the bank up there, behind the yellow pipes that you see, is another chamber sunk. And so the water comes into this one, overflows, and fills that chamber, and we have infiltration in both places. Um, so with the dual chamber, we're looking to see if we gain any benefit um, by having the second chamber that's more free of sediment. Uh, this so. right here is a standpipe that holds the uh, recording device, a pressure transducer, that's installed in the dual chamber dry well. This, uh, this device and the data that uh, uh, we're, we're, we're able to, to uh, record with it uh, measures water depths. Um, from those water depths, we can determine the effectiveness of the single chamber, the primary settling tank, and also the dual chamber, uh, the primary settling tank, and then the dry well. 
um, how much water is getting into it and how fast it's uh, infiltrating into the subsurface. We're standing in a basin without any additional infiltration devices. Uh, of the 13 basins in this channel, we've got some that are plain, some with single dry wells, some with dual dry wells, some with infiltration trenches. We're comparing the data we are gathering continuously on all of those to compare their effectiveness. All the basins are monitored. We've got uh, pressure transducers at uh, all the basins and where there are um, additional augmentation features for infiltration we've got uh, monitoring devices on those as well. We're, we're comparing the data and I think that we're going to find that um, some of the um, augmentation features that we chose during design will prove to be more effective than others, some will prove to be less effective than others, and we can take that, uh, that learning and that information onto the next project and apply that uh, for design uh, the next project. So we're constantly learning on this project. We're, we're gathering information. We've already kind of gotten an indication that the infiltration trenches at a, at a much lower cost and lower technology infiltrate just as much as the uh, dry wells do, uh, which gives us some more information on our next recharge projects. And this being a pilot project, all the data that we continually gather, the analysis that we do, uh, part of the purpose is to spread this information to other projects, not just in our area, but other similar areas, so people can benefit from the work that we're doing here. And we're also teasing out the differences in performance between the single cell, single cell dry wells and the dual, to, dual cell dry wells. We've uh, determined that for the cost, uh, the single cell dry wells uh, may be more effective than the dual cell dry wells. Um, and we've also taken that down a notch to say that um, we may look at something even less elaborate and less um, costly than a, an actual dry well. Maybe we could just um, put in something a lot simpler um, and not involve such heavy construction and, and increased costs. The other thing we're doing here is we're, we're logging and putting together um, what it costs to operate and maintain a system like this because nobody has a system like this. So that's part of the pilot project as well is how often are we going to have to clean out a dry well? Um, what is the, on an infiltration trench, do we try to clean it or do we just dig another one right next door to it because we've got plenty of room in the basin. So, so we're, we're gathering data and putting it to use for a lot of different uh, things. We're now at the bottom of the channel. We've looked at all the recharge facilities and the monitoring as the water makes its way down. I just wanted to show you the original piece of monitoring on this project. There's a well in the little house behind me and uh, it existed on the property when we bought it. And we put some depth to groundwater monitoring on this well about a year and a half before we did the construction. So we have a baseline groundwater uh, level before the project went in. And this well will continue to be monitored and it will show us the growth and part of the movement of the groundwater mound as it makes its way toward the San Pedro River. We're standing right now at the very end of the recharge project. We're at the very east end. We're close to the San Pedro River. Um, we've walked down all the way from the intake basin, the overflow, the culvert under the highway, and all the way through the half mile long channel where the recharge actually takes place. Now we're standing where the water has turned back to sheet flow, runs onto the property behind me, and the next quarter of a mile to the San Pedro River. Um, so we have taken on the very upstream or the west side of the property, sheet flow that's wide, shallow, no channels. We've kind of funneled it in, channeled it through all of our recharge structures, and now we've turned it back to sheet flow, and you can see behind me that there's no channel. There's no channel banks, there's no erosion, that just runs quietly and slowly through the grass, and makes its way to the San Pedro the way it did before we did any of the project.